Good morning, Northeast, and happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. I'm gonna do something in a moment that I'm gonna need all the kids for. So if you're running around, if you are doing something else, come into the room, and in just a moment, I'm gonna do something with you. But first, I wanna give just a couple of announcements, and the first one is I want you to know what to expect from today. We are going to sing some songs together, we are going to share communion together, and then Wayne is going to come and give um, the latest message in our series on the Gospel of Mark. But before we do that, um, I just want to remind you how important connection is. We care about all of you watching this video, we care um, about getting connected with you. And so we want you to stay connected even during this time of quarantine as we start to emerge out of it. And there's two ways to get connected. The first one is to call or text um, the church at 815-633-3536. And that's just a simple way for us to know that you are looking to get connected and to give us an outlet to reach you. And the second one, which is really important to us, is our group's ministry. We want to see every person at Northeast, everyone who calls Northeast home to get plugged into a group because that is the place where you can have a small community that is focused on your spiritual growth and your life care. And so we want to make sure that everyone has that opportunity and to get signed up to be in a group, you can go to northeastcc.com slash groups. Well, kids in the room, I know I brought you in for this and this is your part. In order to celebrate fathers, in order to honor dads today, I came up with a little handshake that I'm gonna teach you to do with your fathers. Now, some of you in the room may be like me. You're saying, hey, my dad's not in the room with me. He may be at work, he may be on a business trip. Whatever it is, whatever reason your dad is not in the room, you are in the same boat as me. I'm not able to be with my dad um, today, but you can still do it with whoever you're watching with watch it or do the handshake with um, your mom, your aunts and uncles, grandparents, siblings, whoever it is that you are watching this video with, practice the handshake with them. But since I'm not with my dad today, I needed to call in some help. So I'm going to teach you the handshake with my good buddy, Zion. So here it is. Hey everybody, this is my buddy Zion. Zion, say hi. Hi. We're gonna teach you our Father's Day handshake. All right, so there's three parts to this. So we'll show you here. Ready? All right, we're gonna do that one more time just so you guys can see it again, all right? Nice. Good work. Point at the camera, wink. There you go. Well, thank you, Zion, for your help with that handshake. And like I said, take some time and practice that with your dad or practice it with your mom, your aunt, uncle, brother, sister, maybe your dog. Whoever is in the room with you kids, go ahead and practice that handshake with them. Well, we are going to move into our time of offering. And as we were thinking through our offering this week, we couldn't help but realize that this is a time of year when we typically would be sending teams to our various missionary partners all over the world. But because of the current situation in the world, we're not able to do that, at least not in the same capacity. But we still want to support these teams. We still want to support these ministries. And so we want to, um, be praying for these ministries. And so each week over the next four weeks, we are going to be showing an update video from one of the ministries that we support. And the goal of this is that we can get an update on what's going on in their lives and in their ministry and hear directly from them um, how this all has affected them. And then the following week, um, or the week following that video, we are going to receive prayer points from them of specific things that they need prayer for. And so we can rally around them as a community in prayer. So we are going to kick that off this week in hearing from our partner from Italy, Stefano. So check out this video. 
Hi, in all this family, this is Stefano from Italy. I'm recording this video in our uh, house that downstairs we have a office space. Yeah, we are exactly at the center of our town. It's called Torre Pellice, a town of 5,000 people. And now I'll show you a video clip that you can have a tour in our town and then I will let you know about more about the ministry that we, we are together involved in and the disciple making movement here in Italy. So here we are and then you can see um, some of my area where I uh, have my uh, base and uh, I show different video clip online and so I editing for you just so you have uh, an idea of what's look like you know our area and our, this environment. Uh, well, this is a very funny vehicle that it's uh, it's uh, historical here so I, I choose to this just so you have a uh, just a view of the uh, the past past of this it, of this this area let's say that Torre Pellice it's a very critical point I would say for the movement because of their story because of the uh, Valdensian movement that has come here year before the reformation but also the thing is my, my family story that my grandfather bought uh, the house where we're living in, in exactly in the center of the town he bought to do ministry to reach the community to serve the community and it's interesting after two generations now God lead me again in this uh, same house in the center of the town you know and calling me to to do the make disciples can make disciples and start from this area and go all over you know our country uh, with different um a different project missionary project and uh, but again also it's like uh, is exactly where everything started here years ago for the evangelical movement in italy because of the Valdezzo church was very important for that you can see you know this is during the summertime we have different writer come and speak you know present their book the valdenza church define the culture of this area so and uh, and also the 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 nature around us it's amazing that you can go out and walk you know and and, and do different kind of activity and i choose some video that you can see around what's look like our our country and uh, so this is you know and also that the, the big deal here it's the our hockey team that the people are really exciting we have a stadium of 3000 people is always full every match and now it's not in the first league but in the second league but years ago they there was ch what there's a compete for to win the league you know and so it was a good uh, we had a good team you know in the past and also sport soccer there is a, a local soccer team and we have also you know uh, other uh, sport like tennis that is another big deal here in uh, in my a lot of people play you know uh, sport but it, it's easy to find people around especially in italy we have a lot of sun you know in this area you know people walk around they sit in the coffee shop go to the restaurant spend time spend time spend time outside you know you can spend time with people also to talk to them and be very uh, relational and i mean living here i I, me I used to meet a lot of people and 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 get to know them a lot so this is interesting point it's it's this it's historical school that the valdensian people uh, uh, founded because they really believe you know in 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 investing in people and what this because of the story here the valdensian movement you can see now some video clip of uh, our youth training event that every November we have in this area the way we train and equip young people to share the gospel and make a disciple that's critical because we just you know following you know the, the different movement around the world you know that uh, uh, that Jesus raised you know uh, for his mission and, and it's interesting that uh, we we start you know this kind of uh, uh, mobilizing event exactly in this area where the Valencia mo movement uh, started here in, in our area so we train and equip them to share the gospel with a different session pray care se share session we call and also we equip them you know and and then we go out in the street here you know to share the gospel with the people they don't know so when they go back home they are really trained and equipped but it's not about the conference we try to you know keep our relationship and investment in them during the year so it's the name is grande mandato means great commission we have even here also the catholic church in this area so you can see now uh, uh, an idea of the church and uh, and again uh, this area it's 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 uh, it's uh, really a place where people come you know for holiday for enjoy the nature to to go to see our museum the Valencia museum to see different movement but uh, also just for a, a base to start their walking up in the mountain we can in a one hour and a half you can be in France walk up in the mountain I mean uh, sorry one hour and a half where you drive up on the road but then you need to walk you know towards uh, the, the border because 
there is no uh, road to go to France and this is the local market another another big deal for a lot of people think about that uh, because we have different small houses up in the mountain we call Borgata that there is a, 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 a van for, uh, belong, to, uh, belong to the city hall that they go up and pick up all people to to have them come down to the market because this is uh, every Friday morning we have our local market you can buy local food so this is Torre Pellice, our base for the movement here in Italy and uh, we are all about, you know, make this up, who can make this up. I serve in Italy through Communitas International, it's a, it's a mission organization that we are here, you know, to, to, to catalyze, you know, movement of disciple making. We have a small team, about eight people right now is growing and we want to raise Italian leaders and I serve as a country leader here in Italy. So, and the, the good things I would say that we have, you know, uh, us in the north and there is a people in the center and people in the south of Italy. But about the number, it's more about, you know, the network that we have to, to influence other churches for the movement of Make Disciple Can Make Disciple. And we work as a catalyzer most of the times, so, you know, just to uh, develop a key relationship, investing in other people for, 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 for see the movement grow and, and, and move forward. For now, we run, you know, business as mission project that we want to reach, you know, the entrepreneur, especially after this coronavirus that uh, uh, most of them will have a dangerous period, a tough period about, uh, about the economical crisis and also we we work a lot with young people. We have a youth ministry called Mazi Last and Change. We want to train, as you see, train and equip them for for make disciples and make disciples. And here in my area, we serve through local uh, le, le, the local churches that we are here. And then always always time, you know, to to be a catalyzer for the movement and to reach more people for for Christ. I want to just say thank you to you, and I'm really looking forward to meet you in person, that we can share more about you know what's look like in our life on mission. And thanks for your investment and thanks that you are part of what we are doing here in Italy, what God is doing through us here in Italy. And um, and so I'm looking forward really to come there and connect with you and know you and get to know you more. And so and talk more about detail, you know, and tell you stories about people that come into Christ and, 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 and became disciples and make disciples. So thank you for watching this video and, and God bless. Bye. It's so great to hear that update from Stefano today. I'm really looking forward to partnering with him in prayer this week, and I hope you'll join us too. As Mike said, happy Father's Day. In honor of that, I'm wearing a t-shirt that Abby made me several years ago. It says, I asked God to make me a better man. He gave me daughters. And that's so true. I believe that they have, and they will continue to make me a better man. Dads, I hope you cherish all the moments and have a fantastic day today. Maybe your kids will even have some special things for you. Wink, wink. Truth be told, other than being with family, all I really wanted desperately was a haircut. So on that note, <laughs> I just want to invite all of you guys, kids, um, if you don't know this song that we're about to sing it's a great song to get up and just jump around. And adults, I'm not excluding you from that. I mean, you can jump up and get excited too because it really is just an invitation for God to open up the heavens because we want to have that face-to-face -face with Him. So let's just sing together.
what a great song and what a, a healthy reminder that we need to live in the presence of God, that we want to be in the presence of Jesus in our day to day. As I was thinking about communion this week, I, I was trying to ponder what it meant in my life. I was trying to ponder all of these different passages and my mind couldn't get off the fact that at its basest form, the elements that we are eating are food. I'm willing to bet that I was probably a little bit hungry when I was thinking through um, communion this week, but I couldn't get my mind off of the food aspect of it. And so I started to think through what my experience with food has been. And lately I've spent more time, I've spent more energy trying different seasonings, different marinades. I've put more thought into my cooking. But the interesting thing is, the more effort, the more time I put in on the front end and the preparation of the food often means I spend less time on the back end. I don't think about each bite. I don't contemplate what the flavors are doing or what the, the meal is doing for me. I just wolf it down so I can get on to the next thing that I have going on. And isn't that true of all of us that we often are crammed so busy with our schedules that we start thinking about the next thing before we're even done with where we're at now that we start to skip down the road and, and rush through what we have going on. Well, there's one moment in our weeks where we have a chance to pause, where we can't just rush through it. And that's with communion. Because for a couple of minutes each Sunday, we get to sit and pause and ponder the implications of one bite of bread and one sip of juice. The reminder that Jesus died for us, the reminder that he took our sins upon himself. We are reminded that we are in the presence of Jesus because his Holy Spirit lives in us. We can't just rush through life, but we can go forward knowing that, our Holy, that the Holy Spirit is living in us that we have the presence of Jesus working in us. How much changes in your life when you sit and reflect on the fact that Jesus is living and working in you. Ponder that for a couple minutes as you take communion. Father, let's run to him. I've carried a burden too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it. I hear your invitation. 
Hello Northeast, my name is Matt Tung and today I will be reading Mark 5 verses 21 through 43. Jesus heals in response to faith. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue whose name was Jairus arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at the crowd pressing around you. How can you ask, Who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, Your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and all his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was twelve years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told them to give her something to eat. Thank you, Northeast. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate you, man. Good job. Welcome everybody. I want to encourage you if you are not currently reading with us through the text. Last week we were Mark chapter 5, this week we'll be Mark chapter 6. And if you want to do a daily reading where we break the text up into smaller parts and read Monday through Friday, I would encourage you to find me on Facebook and friend me. We're just doing a, a journey like that and, and people are, are sharing insights uh, with each other. I share a little bit about my insights each day and it's been really a rich experience to share just that journey together. So I'd encourage you to join. That. Also, I want to answer a question people have been asking when we're going to get back into our building or when we're going to start meeting again. Well, the church hasn't stopped meeting. We're just meeting differently. So I would encourage if you want to be face to face, if you want to be having conversations with people and, and be around the church again, then get in a group. And if you're not in a group, if, if you're currently not experiencing life in group, then go to our website. Let us know you want to be in a group and we'll do our best to try and get you in a group. Otherwise, I would encourage you to start inviting people that you know. Just invite them to your house on a Sunday morning. Make some breakfast and enjoy the service together. Start doing church a little bit differently. We anticipate, hopefully this fall, that the restrictions will allow us to go back into using our building again. Um, we're going to give some updates as soon as we can about what, what the current guidelines are. But right now, it's just too restrictive for us to really use our building effectively. And so we're opting to go into groups. We think that's the best thing for us. So just want to encourage you with that. Also, if you're a student, a child, if you're in the room and you're an adult with a, like me that you know, has a bit ADD, I want to encourage you that while I speak, I want you to, I want you to do something for me. I grab a, a pencil, pen, whatever, piece of paper. You can grab Play-Doh, you can grab Legos, whatever. But I want you today to craft a self-portrait. Just draw yourself, make yourself, form yourself, whatever. Whatever you think is really important about you, the features that, about you that you would want people to know and and see when they see you. I would encourage you to, to incorporate that into your picture. And I'm gonna come back to that uh, at the end. But the things you would want people to notice about you, just go ahead and, uh, and draw those things. I wanna talk about Mark chapter five. Today I wanna to talk about an incident where Jesus meets two people. There's two miracles in one story. And it's, there, it's not a coincidence that this happens. It's not that you know, Jesus is interrupted by this, by, by one, one person trying to help another person. There's a, a, a lesson in this for us today. In Mark chapter five, Jesus travels, at the beginning of Mark chapter five, he travels to a Gentile area and encounters a demon-possessed man who uh, 
Um, he casts out that demon and uh, or multiple demons and they go into pigs and about 2,000 pigs are killed and so the, the people in that area were not excited about Jesus being there and they were like leave our area they, they were afraid for their cows or whatever else that he might destroy so he gets into the boat and he's his disciples go across the lake to a, a more Jewish area and people have heard about Jesus they're they're ready to to watch and listen and learn from Jesus. So this crowd immediately forms and presses in all around him. And it's in this crowd as he's addressing this crowd and hanging around this crowd that a man named Jairus comes up to him. Now Jairus, we know his name. We know what he did for you know, the position he held. He was a synagogue ruler. He was a somebody. We, we know that just because we know his name and we know that he had some rank or position. Even in his ability to come up to Jesus and get access to Jesus tells us that he had some position. In all this crowd, and all these people pressing in, they made way for Jairus to come right in front of Jesus. And when he gets there, he falls to his knees and he makes a request of Jesus because he's exhausted all options to get healing and help for his daughter, 12 year old girl, and this is his last resort. He's like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try Jesus. And so he comes and he falls in, in, on, his, on his knees to Jesus. And here's this man in position, humbling himself, and Jesus says, okay, I'll, I'll go. And as they're traveling then to Jairus' house and the crowd is still pressing in, there is a woman in the crowd that should not be there. And I say that she should not be there because this woman, we don't know anything about. We just know she's a woman and we know that she has an illness. She has a, a, a sickness where she's had bleeding for 12 years. Now she's gone through all the same things that Jairus went through. He went to the doctors, tried to get treatments, tried to get cures for 12 years, trying to find a solution for this. And it only made the situation worse. And so in her misery, she's thinking, I, I could, if I could just touch Jesus's robe. She doesn't have the confidence or the position to approach Jesus from the front. She's not gonna come right to Jesus face to face. The crowd won't make way for her. So she thinks, I'm, I'm just going to come up from behind. And she shouldn't be there because because of this disease, she should be declaring that she's unclean. She'd be, she should be yelling to everybody that she's coming. So in a crowd like this, she should not be there because she probably could not have gotten to Jesus without touching people. And if the crowd would have, would have found out that she was there, that she was unclean and, and amongst them, she could have been stoned to death. But she's taking the risk to get to Jesus. And she goes up to Jesus and when she touches his robe, she believes his power will flow out of the robe. That is a uh, superstition of their day, that someone's power can flow through their clothing. So she reaches up and she touches the hem of his garment. And in that moment, she feels relief of pain. Well, Jesus feels energy go out of him too, and he knows something happened. I don't know if you've ever had a chronic illness like that, chronic pain, and then it's removed. What a relief that feeling is. I had a scratched cornea one time, miserable absolutely miserable for days we were on a car trip then you know I, I scratched it the day before we get in the car we're driving to Orlando my wife has to drive all the way there because I can hardly open my eyes we get to Orlando we're walking around Disney I can hardly open my eyes I'm 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 miserable sitting on the curb while my kids are going on rides that night at the hotel I couldn't stand it anymore and, and I finally said I, I gotta go to the doctor I gotta get to the emergency room so we're finding a, a hospital in Orlando in the middle of the night they take me in, they take me to an exam room, they look at my eye, they say, yeah, you got a scratch cornea. They put these drops in my eyes. And the moment they put the drops in my eyes, it was like the pain was gone. I'd had it for three days and the pain was gone. And to have that just three days of pain gone, it was like such a relief because it was so draining to feel the pain. I cannot imagine what 12 years of pain would feel like to have in a moment the pain be gone. But she feels this instant relief in her body. Now she's hightailing it out of there, but Jesus won't let her. And here's why, because Jesus wants to make a point. Jesus wants to make an example here. And that is that Jesus can overcome differences. In the crowd, the, the, the people would look at Jairus and they would say that he's a somebody. They would look at this woman and they would say that, he, that she's a nobody. She shouldn't even be there. She would be rejected. She would be on the outskirts of society. She would not have any friends. She would not be surrounded by people. But Jairus, he was someone to look up to. He was a man of position, stature. That's why we know his name. We don't even know her name. But Jesus makes a point to stop. And he says, who touched me? The disciples think he's crazy because everybody's touching him. 
but he knows someone touched and I think you know who, who it was. He just wants to make an example here. And so he says, who touched me? And this woman sheepishly comes up out of the crowd and admits to what she'd done. And Jesus says these words to her and they're powerful words. Matter of fact, these words were not spoken to anyone else in the New Testament. He says, daughter. He calls her his daughter. Now, undoubtedly, this is for the crowd a, a throwback to what Jairus had just been requesting. I mean, the crowd's watching Jairus fall to his knees and say, my daughter is ill. Come, heal my daughter. And Jesus wants to make a point that this woman the crowd's rejected is his daughter. He wanted her to know that she was his daughter. He says, your faith has made you well. The word well there means whole, complete, both physically and spiritually complete. She'd received the physical um, healing because Jesus also had the power to overcome disease. But he, she received the emotional healing and the wholeness of being spiritually well. See, Jesus overcomes sin as well. You can't look at this and you can't not think about the current situation in our culture. Where there's some who feel like they're pushed to the side or treated as less. The truth is that prejudice is in all of us. I'm, I'm shooting now under the bridge downtown and I chose this location because I thought it would be symbolic of a place where other people are that are different than me. What I didn't realize is that coming down here would mean that I've been down here for two days trying to shoot this video. I keep getting interrupted by people that are walking up to me different than me, different color, different, different circumstances in life. And I've, I've tried to pause long enough to give them my name and to get their name and just to have conversations. And those conversations have proven to be a little longer than I anticipated. But I met Joe and I met, uh, I heard about his experience with riding horses on his uncle's ranch. and. I met Calvin, who's down here scoping uh, fishing spots, and we talked about the differences of the fish that I, I try and catch and the fish he's trying to catch. And we, we swapped fishing stories, and you know, there's something awesome about just pausing long enough not to just notice the differences that we have with people, but to recognize the things that we have in simil you know, similarities and to accept people by giving their name, giving, giving your name and, and, and listening to their name and listening to their stories. It's been powerful for me to be down here. Now, this is a day when we need to be listening and we need to be learning about other people's experiences and not just thinking our own has formed a solid opinion and that, that opinion is sure. Because the truth is our opinions are formed by just our experiences and our experiences are not complex. They're, they're not as complex as they could be or should be. And so without gaining the experience of others, our opinions formed on our experiences are probably lacking. So Jesus takes this moment and he, and he gives some validity to this woman by just saying, daughter, your faith has healed you. Shalom, peace, uh, go free of your suffering. And I pray that that would be our posture position as a church, that we would be looking for people to say, look, we want peace and, and we want you to have shalom. We want you to, to live in peace and to be free from suffering. That was the heart of Jesus. Now in this moment, Jairus is probably a little bit frustrated because He's been delayed long enough that people have come from his house to say, look, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter is gone. And Jesus looks at him and says, don't be afraid, have faith. In the same way this woman had faith, I want you to have faith in me. You're a somebody, she was a nobody. Her faith was more, I want you to have the same faith that she had. And so they walk the rest of the way to his house and when they get there, the wailing and the chaos is in full commotion. I mean, it's fully, it's, it's on. And in those days, they would hire people to, to wail and to mourn. And so he walks into this chaos and he tells it to stop. It basically tells him to stop. And he's like, what's all the commotion? She's only sleeping. Of course, they think that's crazy again, the same way the disciples thought he was crazy earlier. They don't understand the full complexity of what Jesus' power was or what he could do. But he takes the mom and dad, and he walks into the bedroom and, where the girl's been laid, and, 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 he, and he says to her, little girl, get up. And she does. I want you to know that Jesus not only has the power to overcome differences, the power to overcome disease, the power to overcome sin, but the power to overcome death. There's not a scene in the New Testament where Jesus doesn't walk into to death 
and turn the finality of death into sleep. Every occasion, he takes death and he turns it to sleep. Now I know when, when you and I go to bed at night, we often don't, we don't feel that anxiety of thinking that we're not gonna wake up in the morning or that this is final. We think about it as sleep. We go to sleep, we close our eyes, and in a moment we're awake, we're awake again. That's what it feels like. And that's exactly how Jesus makes death. There's a day when we're gonna close our eyes and we're gonna awake, awaken. But death is not final, it does not hold us, it's simply sleep. Because Jesus has the power to overcome the finality of death. It's an incredible lesson for us, it's an incredible reminder. Now I want you to go and look at those images, those pictures that you've got drawn. And I want you to think about this, I want you to think about the image of yourself and what is it that you think that you want people to know? What is it that you want people to notice? As I look at your pictures or, and I see your pictures, what is it that you're wanting people to notice about you? And the question is, do you notice those same things in others? In other words, when you look at others, do you see the same things that you want people to notice in you? Because oftentimes what we find is we want people to notice certain things about us, but when we're looking at other people, we don't, we don't look for those same things. It's really important that we look for the same things in others that we want people to look for in ourselves. That's how we overcome the differences. I wanna give you a couple of questions just to think about today. When you think about fear right now, when you think about the things you fear, the truth is if, if there's anything that we fear, whether it's differences or whether it's disease or whether it's death, there's things in our life right now that we fear. Anything we fear, we don't have faith about. If there's something in our life that we fear, then it means that we don't have faith enough that Jesus could overcome it. So right now, think about the things you fear, and then I want you to think about this question. What is the one thing you fear right now, and do you believe that Jesus has the power to overcome it? Think about those. God bless you guys. Stop working Even when I don't see it You're working Even when I don't feel it You're working You never stop You never stop working You never stop You never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, 
Jesus is so much bigger than our fears, and there's a lot of fear out there today. But Jesus is the one that makes a way through our fears. He's the one that lights up the darkness, and he's the one that heals the heart. Jesus is living and working in your lives, and so focus on him this week. And whenever fear comes up, whenever fear starts to well up inside you, just ask yourself the question, is this fear bigger than Jesus. Well, as we wrap up this week, I just want to remind you that you can put any prayer requests down in the chat below, or you can go on our website, northeastcc.com slash prayer wall, and you can add your prayers there so that we can see them and that we can be praying for you and supporting you during this time. Well, I'm going to wrap us up in prayer. So if you can bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for um, the gift of fatherhood. I thank you that we have um, an example in you of what um, a heavenly father is supposed to be. And I thank you um, for all the fathers out there and the influence that they have in us, on us and the impact that they have in our lives. God, I pray that you would help us to move forward, not without fear, but with the confidence to work through our fears the confidence to move forward, boldly knowing that you are bigger than any fears we may face. We love you, Lord, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Have a great weekend, Northeast.